Okay. So first of all, thank you to everybody for joining and a huge thank you to Tom for his wealth of knowledge that he's going to share with everybody today. Um, of course, the topic of today's conversation is the impact of growth. And when we talk about growth, we're talking about new electric demand specifically and how that impacts transmission and ensuring, so the impact of growth on the customer and ensuring a neighborly approach. How do we upgrade aging infrastructure, increase load, handle challenges with employment, et cetera, respond to new regulation? How do we do all those things? Um, because it's our prerogative, it's our job and keep our customers at the center of all we do and keep them happy. So that's that's the goal and that's the focal point on today's conversation. And Tom Schaefer um, is joining us here today and I'll introduce him in a moment. Um, my, I'm Patrick Norris, I'm vice president here at Earth and we're the owners of a platform for damage prevention. So the 811 ticketing platform, we're the folks that make sure that we identify high risk tickets so that they don't impact buried assets. We also have an enterprise training system to make sure that everybody in your organization and your contractors are adequately equipped and prepared to do the tasks that they are uh, asked to do out in the field in, in real world. And of course, a land slash right away management system. So those are some of the main things that we do. We'll talk more about that. Uh, my background, I started at Georgia Power and Southern Company uh, over in Atlanta, spent some time at Esri as an account manager, helping organizations with their geospatial strategy throughout the Western U.S. And here at Earth, I help with the platforms that I just mentioned, specifically focusing on land management. And Tom is our resident expert here that we're going to be talking to about right away and expanding that. Um, Tom's a senior manager at American Electric Power, senior manager of right -of -way. And the neat thing is he's got over 20 years of experience in right -of -way, with the bulk of this being in leadership. Uh, Tom is the chair of IRWAs, which is the International right -of -way Association. He's the chair of the Electric Committee. He's also a member of the Buckeye chapter locally in Ohio. And he also participates in the Midwest Utility uh, Peer Leadership Group. So, Tom, you're a super busy guy, and we can't thank you enough for joining us today and um, helping us all kind of get up to speed with what you've been working on over the last 20 years in your career. Yeah, glad to be here. I mentioned a little bit about Earth. I'll, I'll cover a couple of things. So, um, Earth, we have lots of clients. We have over 500. Uh, Many of the big brands that you 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 know see and interact with on a daily basis, including Verizon, Chevron, uh, many large investor-owned utilities. In fact, seventeen of the top twenty Fortune 500 companies that own infrastructure leverage Earth uh, to protect their critical network infrastructure. And another thing I'll say about Earth is that. Our customers that you know work with us tend to stay with us. Our average customer lifespan is 11 years and growing. And Tom, of course, represents AEP, and, and that's going to be the bulk of the focus today. A couple of things I want to point out here. First, when you look at the map of AEP service territory, you'll notice that AEP is tasked with providing reliable electric service to 11 states. And you see a concentration in the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia area, as well as down in Texas throughout the state, as well as Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. So vast geography is what AEP serves, which is not necessarily unique. There's other electric companies in the U.S. that have a similar service territory, but nobody in the country has as many transmission miles as AEP. AEP is the largest by a long shot at having 40,000 miles of transmission, which is mind blowing. I know personally, when I was at Southern Company, we were 26, 27,000 miles, which was enough to handle in and of itself across our states. And you know, Tom and his group are responsible for maintaining and growing 40,000 miles of electric transmission, which is, I mean, it, that's a staggering number. 
uh, to keep your 5.6 million customers uh, lights on. So uh, really neat uh, that we're able to have this conversation uh, with, with you, Tom, on that. And before we really get started talking about some of the pain points in the industry, do you mind sharing a little bit more about your role and how that's evolved over the last 20 years and how your team has grown? Sure, sure. Um, again, thanks for the opportunity here this afternoon. Appreciate taking the time to, to go through this. Uh, very passionate what I do and, and always appreciate these opportunities to talk about what we do here at AEP, uh, what our right away does to, to support the work and our customers here at AEP. Um, I'll start with uh, just in the role that I currently have here. It's evolved over about a 12 year period of time. Um, I came to AEP around 2006, uh, got promoted in, in 2010 to, to a manager role at AEP. Uh, going into that role, uh, went from distribution specifically around the Central Ohio area and supporting uh, projects and, and conducting uh, right away tasks and as well as coordinating projects. Um, moved into the manager role around August 2010. Uh, the interesting factoid there, um, we were doing just a couple hundred million dollars of capital, CapEx work across our system. And we had 17 employees at that time coming over. Um, we had uh, at that also, um, uh, we had uh, three supervisors at that time with those 17 uh, employees and and we had three service providers um, so we're still doing a little bit of work um, compared to today we've grown uh, about 400 uh, percent so over the, those 12 period or 12 years over that period of time we've, we've definitely grown our teams and, and our teams are structured much differently because of that growth um, we have another manager that helps support the work and you're talking about those 40 plus thousand miles of, of transmission line um, it's, you know, it takes a lot to, to be able to continue to keep up. And then also with our investment, you know, we look at supporting our investment. You know, we're sitting here approximately $3 billion worth of CapEx investment today across our system. So just over that 12 years, or excuse me, 12 uh, year period of time, it's, it's definitely taken off. And, 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 and part of that also is, um, you know, we've got supervisors now that are, are more regionalized, uh, that don't have uh, when I was in here in 2010, the, the large span of, of regions. Uh, we currently in our Eastern footprint uh, have a manager. There's there's two supervisors, um, one in Roanoke, one, one in Charleston. I report to that manager. There's also uh, two here at our Central Ohio office that, that cover our Ohio area. Uh, and we have a supervisor that covers our Indian Michigan area. Uh, they approximately have uh, 10, 12 uh, plus right away agents and then uh, two office staff that help support uh, our records and, and the capital work plan assignments. In our Western footprint, um, we also have uh, two supervisors in Texas uh, that help um, support that work. Uh, we also have one in Tulsa, Oklahoma that supports uh, the, the RTO SPP uh, region there. Uh, and then we have another supervisor uh, where a couple of years ago we created a central organization where we do uh, um, projects that may impact the entire system. Um, and so those those projects run through uh, that team, uh, telecom being one of the, one of the main uh, investments that we have really taken off the past few years and why we, we put that role together um, and that team together. And all of our teams, again, they're approximately 10, 12 plus agents. Uh, so. You know, we, we took off from 17 and 10 to uh, I think around 2012, 2013, we doubled that to around 34, maybe up to 35, 36. Um, and then uh, the past three years, you know, we're, we're sitting here uh, at um, almost, almost uh, I think around 75 total um, employees that help support our work. And you know, when we talk about that role, um, it really falls back on the team and the work that they do on a daily basis. That growth just continuing uh, to to take off. Um, so, in, in the sense that we have those six regions and we have our two managers uh, that help support that, um, you know, I really can't say enough about the leadership that's been able to help support that growth. Um, and then the employees that we have, because there's a lot of work and it, it takes a, a lot of time away. And a lot of effort. But. You know, the, the one other thing I'll, I'll add to that, Patrick, um, 
you know, I mentioned our CapEx. Uh, so when we look at the, the, the role that they play, we talk about right away agents. Um, you know, I mentioned we had three suppliers. We have 11 now um, that we also use, and, and you know, we also could be able to do the work without them because you know, they're the ones that are in the front of the work. Uh, they're out there, the ones working with landowners, dealing with the public, uh, being the interface uh, with, with our AAP brand. Uh, our internal agents that I mentioned, the 70, 75 so agents are, are really helping um, you know, manage those vendor relationships of being able to put scope estimates together and really changing that dynamic to the field work in the front level that they once did 10 plus years ago to you know, being more in office and being help and supporting projects and you know, ensuring that we're meeting our investment targets. And, also ensuring that we meet our own M obligations uh, when it comes to those 40,000 line miles, because it's, it's a load within itself. The growth in your organization is, is really impressive. And when we start talking about some of these business problems, it becomes more and more apparent how necessary that is to to have grown your organization and and especially your suppliers like you said you're not doing it just all internally you can't do it all alone right you grow better right. together so i want to talk about five or six central challenges that are affecting aep and and really anyone that's operating um, high voltage transmission across uh, really anywhere in north america and of course every every organization these numbers are going to look slightly different, but going back to the size of AEP and having 40,000 miles of transmission, can you talk a little bit about the age, the average age of those assets and the amount of work that sits in front of you in the next 10 years? I believe a number you shared with me is as much as one fourth of the system yep. needs to be yep. either replaced or upgraded in the next decade. So how do you even begin to unpack that? Yeah, it, uh, you know, the, the graph, of, um, and, and some that may be on here have seen the graph, and it's a pretty cool graph. Um, sets of, for me, you know, kind of a history and data nerd, um, just you could look at you know, early 1900s and the fact of where we are today and how much investment we've taken uh, you know, since then. And, you know, where economy has been good, uh, you see the investment increase, um, you know, where economy may not have been so good, things have kind of plateaued a little bit and may have reacted to, um, certain things, but as we're sitting here today and the environment we're in, um, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting there at about 70 years of just life expectancy on our transition lines. And, you know, that's a lot that we've got to continue to invest into the customer. Uh, so when you talk about the investments that we make and, you know, keeping those upgrades continuously through, um, it's, it's a, it's a predominantly big size. Um, and, you know, we've been fortunate where I mentioned back in, in 2010 when I came into this role and you know, we really took off with, with our investment targets, uh, being able to put money back into our transmission lines and our transmission assets, uh, and being able to, to build those uh, for the customer and rehabbing those lines. Um, it was a tremendous opportunity and today is, is pretty unique because we're continuing to invest and we're always going to continue to invest, um, but you know, we started to see a little bit of low growth or maybe that's taken away in some of our investment opportunities. Uh, but ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, that's always going to be a priority across our system and across the network. Um, and the fact that we're investing into those assets and replacing those assets, you know, the other parts of that and the role that our team has and where we really do a good job is the level of outreach that we have to take in, you know, in the sense of replacing the line or re rebuilding the line. Um, you know, we're looking at ensuring that we have outreach engagement with our stakeholder groups, uh, if it's the regulatory bodies or if it's just the customer, um, as well as maybe other stakeholders that go into it. You know, we want to ensure that we're proactively outreaching and telling the story as to why we're doing what we're doing, the need for what we're doing. Um, and and the, the other part of that is um, where historically, if we haven't been able to, let's say, regularly maintain that right away, it needs to be maintained that it's another opportunity to be able to that um, now not all of those are capital dollars, but also gives us the opportunity to get in front of it. Um, but we're also able to take a look at our existing accesses, our easements, um, and, the, and, and potentially either supplementing or amending those, bringing those terms up to modern terms today, 
where you know we're, we're kind of starting from uh, you know, new in the sense of we haven't historically been able to maintain it really well. It's, it's our, our easements are, are really old, maybe even vague, and able to really modernize those and bring those up to today's terms. We're able to do that. So we really take a look at that strategy and ensuring that investing those dollars in, into those assets. Um, you know, if the customer is going to be at the front of that, we'll always continue to be at the front of that. It's given us a lot of opportunity in the sense of you know why we needed to grow as, as much as we grow, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but also trying to stay proactive and stay in front of it with the amount of line miles that we have and the challenges within itself, and really continuing to keep those up to date and modern. You mentioned uh, you mentioned modernizing easements. So in the sense that you have a line or a corridor, and perhaps it's it's not end of life yet perhaps everything is mostly okay i mean you're you're doing reg, uh you know routine maintenance both from a vm standpoint as well as from a you know physical maintenance you know rust etc but you do find from a a land agreement perspective that hey this is not really up to speed this is not up to code anymore how do you go out and is that a renegotiation is it just a going to the courthouse and getting the right documents, bringing them back into your system, or what are those processes yeah. look like for you? That, that's a good question. Um, you know, and, and there really isn't the, the one size fits all answer to this, but, you know, I can you know, talk through just a couple of examples in the sense of, you know, where we may have been challenged with the rights that we have, um, but at the end of the day, it's going to fall back on the customer. It's going to fall back on the relationship that we have with that customer. In the sense that we've got a good positive relationship, we say and do, what, or excuse me, do what we say we're going to do, and you know, we continue to have that level of outreach and keeping our customers aware of the work that we're doing. Things tend to go a little bit better, a little bit more smoother, obviously, than, than the other side of things, where we just go out and we just do it, and we don't do any proactive approach to it. We don't outreach. Um, we just go in and we go out. You know, and we're, we're doing veg management. Um, you know, we, in the sense of, hey, what's going on? Um, you know, it leaves a, a little bit of a taste in, the, in that customer's mouth as to what, what's ABP doing. So, you know, we really have, have um, looked at how we keep our records up to date uh, from a technology standpoint. Our GIS platform has, has taken off to, you know, where we can identify who those landowners are, who those customers are, um, identify, you know, if there's been a level of threats from a safety perspective to ensure. Before we go out there, what proactive measurements do we need to take before we go out there? You know, we pull our easements and identify what's the width that we have, what have we historically maintained, what is it that we want to be able to get to you know, over time, technology changes, standards change. We may have historically maintained X for the last X amount of years, the standards changing. You know, we may want to try to go ahead and, and maintain Y now uh, to be able to keep up with certain standards. And so those conversations are always continuously happen day in and day out. It's really what keep our teams busy. Um, you know, where we've stubbed our toes, so to speak, um, you know, is where we may not have taken advantage of technology um, or we may not have had that level of technology. And we went out there thinking, you know, we have the right to do this and, and it's, it's okay to do it. Um, and that's usually when you start getting challenges. It's usually when you start getting questions. It's usually when, you know, utility commissions in that given state are called by the by the customer that we're having to explain ourselves. Things that that we want to be able to overcome uh, by being able to take a more proactive approach, be able to invest in technology, be able to invest in our employees, and providing those tools for our employees. You know, to be able to not just do the job, but do it safely and do it effectively and efficiently. And again, it falls back to the customer, right? That's the piece that we always want to have in the forefront of our mind as we do any of our projects. Yeah, no, I like that. It's it's good to know what you're what you're walking into, right? Whether you have the rights to do to t take a clearing to where you think you do, and even better if you can have that information, you know, in your holding up my phone, but you know, right there at your fingertips. Right. Um, hey, well, I wanted to remind everyone that it's uh, encouraged to ask questions. We'll we're going to reserve about fifteen minutes towards the end of the dialogue to um, answer uh, as many questions as we can. So you can submit those through the chat feature. Um, with that, um, Tom, I wanna pivot to, so we just talked about the fact that the infrastructure is is aging and what you guys are doing to, uh, to, uh, to maintain that. 
and replace and, and upgrade as necessary. Um, with all that, your service territory is one of the hottest markets in the country right now as far as load growth, especially when it comes to data centers. So can you talk a little bit about AEP's economic development strategy and how that, um, you know, winning new business for certain states, like all states are taking off, but I mean, I'm going to hone in on Ohio and Texas specifically. Um, sure. Those two states are really growing. Um, and you showed me a graphic last week of different new businesses that exist in those states. So um, if you don't mind sharing whatever you can that's public on some of those new uh, customers that you guys have attracted to your service territory yeah. over the last few years and what your economic development strategy looks like. Yeah, you know, it, it, again, it starts with our, our economic development team and strategy that they put together and relationships that we build. And you, know, you back up five, seven plus years ago and you get over the housing boom uh, you know, prior to that. And, and then you leave with, okay, what levels of investment opportunities do we have to be able to put back into our facilities and, and being able to ensure that we've got a you know, liability for our customers. But, and, and also in the sense of what level of, of load is there going to be? Um, and you know, we've seen an increase and it's really taken off, especially the past year and a half. And we give a lot of, a lot of kudos to our development team. And also with, with our team, you talk about Ohio and Texas specifically, um, you know, we've also seen a little bit of, of an increase in, in our Indiana, Michigan footprint around that South Bend, Fort Wayne area. Um, and we're seeing it elsewhere too, but in the sense of things, you know, they become the forefront in, in trying to drive in customers in the sense of what we're able to bring from a reliability standpoint in, in, in a pretty quick fashion. Um, and, and that's really, you know, when you talk about the customer or even the future customers, it really is, you know, what can you bring me? And how quickly can you bring it? Uh, you know, to be able to ensure that we're able to turn our lights on you know, sooner than later. And we work really close um, with our economic development team and bring, being able to bring in those customers where, where we've identified the potential of bringing in our customers. You know, you talked about data centers specifically. Uh, you know, it's no secret here in our eastern central Ohio area in the New Albany area where it's it's, it's taken off with, with data centers and and also the other part to that is uh, you know being able to identify industrial customers to bring in to uh, around our ports you mentioned Texas you got the port of Corpus Christi um, you know need there to be able to identify potential customers to, to bring in um, and you also look at you know the renewable side, not taking it away from the question, but you know, those are also mm -hmm. customers that are wanting to connect to the grid. And all these customers, it's the, you know, they're racing to the finish line in the sense of how they can get there sooner and quicker. And and us is you know the the other side of it and, and trying to also bring in not just from a low growth investment opportunity, but also brings opportunity, you know, for the area and the community. Uh, in, in the aspect of those customers coming in, having job opportunities, also investing in those communities. You know, it is definitely a relationship. And it's, uh, again, you know, kudos to our economic development. But we're definitely seeing low growth there for sure. Um, you know, I know we talked about the 40,000 miles, and we're increasing those to be able to identify strategic areas where we may have sources that we don't have to bring a long way uh, to be able to connect them. Um, so, you know, investing into our assets, into our customer, also trying to be able to drive in other customers uh, through that economic development aspect of things. Um, and again, you know, we've seen an increase there to do that. And, um, you know, the one of the biggest challenges that we have is, you know, just assuring that we're going to deliver and we're going to be able to do what we say we're going to do with the commitments that we have. And that's the piece where we got to make sure internally, you know, all parties and stakeholders understand, you know, what the environments are that we can deliver on in the sense of we got to get a certificate, um, we got to cite the line, we got to go through you know, a public outreach as well, and also the level of right away acquisition that we may need to do. Um, so it's it's definitely a team effort uh, when you bring all those facets together. With that. That was... Perfect. Perfect. So 
economic development is outselling, attracting business to your service territory. And now you need to build a new line or maybe it's a renewable client and you need to build a new line to connect point A to point B. Regardless of voltage, what does that process look like, especially the communication factor? That's what you really were harping when we were talking about this earlier. You got to communicate early and often. So can yeah. you talk about yeah. that a little bit? Well, you know, I think the, the, the first piece is you know, understanding the commitment um, in the sense of being able to bring customers. Um, and, you know, again, when they're expecting to be able to put, put our line in service and, and being able to connect them based on whatever source that we're bringing to them, you know, our, our low growth that we're seeing, um, you know, is really looking at the aspect of what's the reliability need and then what's our current reliability that we can provide. Is there upgrades that we need to take, uh, you know, in our stations? Is it a new station? Is it new greenfield lines? Is it rebuilding our existing line, upgrading the voltage, to bring that source in? Um, you know, our planning job, our planners do a really good job of being able to identify uh, that and, and run through their load studies. And again, it comes back to that team. But um, you know, there are going to be requirements dependent on the voltage and dependent on if it's a greenfield line and how, how many miles it is, what level of impacts is it going to have the landowners if it's going to drive a certain certificate in that given state, or if it's not. Um, you know, I'll I'll say this. Um, that no matter how we're looking at the project, you know, that proactive outreach approach is always going to be taken into consideration. We have requirements that we have to be able to abide by with obtaining a certificate. But if not, for the most part, we're going to take those same steps. Um, we're going to want to do outreach. We're going to want to be able to understand landowners' concerns, customers' concerns, utilize those, and we look at you know, what's the least impactful route for this line to go from point A to point B. No matter if we need to get a certificate or not, you know, it's important to us that we bring our customers in and our landowners in to be able to understand and, and give them a voice um, before we finalize the line route. Again, no matter if we're driving to get a certificate or not. Um, so, one of those things back to the relationship component of it, back to the, you know, the customer aspect of this um, is really important to ensure the success of being able to, to get that source to that customer. And how are you communicating with the customers? Is this via social media? Is this via mail? Is this, uh, how, how are you reaching these customers? All the above, all the above. Um, you know, uh, interesting um, enough that you asked that question. This earlier this this week, um, you know, we were talking internally and, you know, I'll go back to 2010 when I came into this role and I think it was around, 20, excuse me, 2012 um, when, we created a, a siting and outreach aspect to our transmission work. A lot of it was done through our operating companies, through port communications, through our engineering teams. It may have been a right-of-way agent in the field trying to say where we can get easements and trying to dissect where the line's going to go. Uh, all that has definitely changed uh, for, for the betterment of the work that we do. And um, you know, our siting team and our outreach team does a phenomenal job of, you know, ensuring that what we're doing is is right for the customer, is right for the landowners. And the outreach component of it, um, you know, we look at every potential avenue or form that, that we can ensure that we're getting in front, if it's Facebook, if it's uh, a, a newspaper article, um, you know, if it's leaving messages with our customers, letting them know, um, you know we're gonna have a, a open house or a public meeting for this project. And then of course, you know, you've got mailers, um, we also have where we go out, put door hangers, um, you know, to try to ensure that we're communicating and get out in front of the landowner. So we take all those aspects in consideration. So, you know, there may be a better means in one area versus another, but all those is going to be taken into consideration. What we feel is going to be the best outreach message that we can get in front of our customers and our landowners. Excellent. Excellent. That's what I was expecting to hear. There was an omni-channel approach. Um, Let's talk a little bit about employment challenges. So we were talking about histograms earlier to outline the average age of the 
infrastructure and you can follow those clear economic boom and bust cycles that our country has gone through over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, 10 years ago, everyone was talking about the fact that a lot of knowledge was about to walk out the door in the next five years. And that, yeah. for the most part, that happened. There was a yeah. lot of retirement five or six years ago. Now we have a new wave of workforce. So I kind of want to ask a couple of questions. What are employees looking for today? And it may not necessarily have anything to do with demographics. It's a shifting time post COVID. We saw the impact of the great resignation, the impact of everyone, not everyone, but many people wanting a hybrid or remote work option. So can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing now as far as wishes or demands from employees uh, in the workforce? Yeah, it's all the way above. Um, you know, I, the, you know, I can go back in you know, 2010 when you had 17 people and you know, the, the voice you know, isn't as strong as it is when you're trying to listen to you know, 70 to 75 people. And, um, <clears throat> and, and the fact of, of building off of that and being able to um, you know, create a culture that's sustainable to our teams, uh, understanding the parameters that we're all working within and, you know, working with the utilities, sometimes those environments change. And you know, one of the things that, that I've seen here just in, in my career, change is inevitable in some mm -hmm. shape, form, or fashion. Um, it's really making sure us as leaders are communicating effectively to understand what those parameters are. Um, you know, some are going to be totally okay with the parameters uh, that, that are set. Um, some are going to want a little bit more uh, of, of flexibility in those parameters. Uh, and sometimes that's okay too, um, based on, on the work that, that that individual may be performing or the work that we're doing. For, for us and our teams, and you mentioned, you know, the aspect uh, of the great resignation. And I think we were probably all a little fearful back in the COVID days and we were going into COVID and you know, I know for us, it, it seemed like, hey, on Friday, we want you to go home for Monday and Tuesday, and we want to be able to test remote work and what that looks like. And the next thing you know, we're we're three months into this, and we're all working from home, and we're all asking, is this going to work? How, how's it going to work? And how can we continue to ensure that we're staying in front of our customers, you know, through that COVID time period and putting, again, it's a change. And, and to some degree, it was a little reactionary. Um, in the fact of ensuring that we're abided by you know, at that given time, whatever the COVID protocols were, we had ours, we had to ensure you know, our, our suppliers have theirs, they mirrored ours in the aspect of, of, of the safety of, of keeping them and us and our customers safe. And then you had that great resignation where you know, we were also trying to build and grow into that, that time period at the same time. Um, so people were coming in, working remotely, with the unknown of, are you gonna go back to your, are you all going back to the office? If so, five days, like you know, were, you know, is it gonna be a hybrid? And back in 2020, was, we didn't know. Um, and, and so we went to the office two days um, coming off of that um, and seems to be progressing well. And then we were asked to come in a third day. Um, and, and really it was kind of going back before the COVID where we were really trying to build that culture that was sustainable to be able to stay within um, or in front of our employees and our teams and how we are regionalized here to execute our work safely and successfully, it's, it's really staying within the region. Um, you know, some of our teams, they're always gonna be remote, um, but you know, we still would like to see them in the office to be able to, to create a culture that stays in front of them to be able to work together, talk together, um, you know, ping things off of one another as to a level of seniority versus somebody that just that may just came in one year or two years that, that may not have had the same level of experience where they're completely accessible to them. Um, and that's something that you know, we continue to look at the days in the office and the hybrid method that we're in today. Right now, we're all in three days a week. Um, you know, some of our, our teams are fully remote based on different circumstances, but on you know, the right away side and the signing and outreach side, you know, we are in three days a week for those reasons. Um, you know, and the other part to that is that we've seen with the, the large size and increase of our teams as they're coming in is you know, what's growth and development look like, um, you know, and, and also what level of voice do I have to be able to say these are the tools that are working. These are the tools that you gave me that aren't working so well that, you know, need to be upgraded, need to be modernized or 
we need some level of efficiencies for whatever reasons that may be. Um, if it's reporting, you know, we talked GIS a little bit, you know, all those things play a role in, in the success of the work that we do, but also the success of our teams and the individuals within the teams. Um, you know, we create forums to be able to identify where there may be gaps in our culture to understand for us as leaders working from the bottom up. So it's always not a you know, top down approach in the sense of uh, can we work within those things that we're being told what our gaps are and the parameters that we've been given. And, you know, some cases we can, you know, we, we talk a lot about controlling what's in our 20 square feet and a lot of, you know, what we hear, what we do, you know, there's opportunity to do that. You know, in some cases they're not, unfortunately, you know, those are things that we, we just put them in the parking lot, and, you know, make sure that we don't lose sight of them, uh, ensure that, you know, if the time comes and you know, we're able to have a little bit more flexibility in those parameters that you know, we bring those back to the table for certain levels of efficiencies for our teams. Um, but, you know, things have definitely evolved and changed, and I'd say changed for the better. Um, and, and the approach that we really need to ensure that we take is providing that time for our teams to create those forums where they feel comfortable to have a voice. And when you're talking about just you know, 75 people alone in our right away teams and spread all the way across you know, the map that you showed, always isn't the easiest thing. Um, coming off of teams, going into the office, you know, and, and then also using that hybrid of teams in some cases uh, because some project members may not be in that given office. Um, you know, so, and then ultimately, you know, continuing to utilize technology um, you know, to sustain that culture that we want and, and also to be able to really give them a voice to hear. And so we can understand again where those gaps may be. Um, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> excuse me, Patrick, um, without creating those forums, no matter if it's hybrid, face-to-face, -face, uh, it, it's important to create, to, to really know what it's gonna end up being that is gonna provide those tools for them to be successful for the levels of forums that they need to be successful in. Um, because we know these people are gonna grow, gonna replace the you, they're gonna replace the me, as well as others at some point in time, ultimately wanna make sure that we give them that path and, and give them that trajectory to, to, to be successful in whatever path that they end up taking. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. So, little birdie has been telling me that there may be impending governance on transmission lines even below 200 kV. The NERC, NERC is putting out guidance that in the spring, as early as the spring, you may have to start treating your 100 to 200 kV lines the same that you have done your typical high voltage 200 plus kV lines. Can you talk a little bit about that new guidance. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, we work really close with, with our forestry teams. And, you know, right now, currently, when you're talking about back uh, so 305 and, and aspect of what our veg management plans relatable to, to uh, what used to be you know, above 200 kV, which is now going below. And it's really going to involve our, our 138 kV system. And it's what deems is critical. Obviously, EHV, 345, 765 are, are, are EHV system lines that, that are always going to be critical to the customer um, and the reliability aspect of, of the grid. We've got certain 138s, too, that are, that are identified as, as critical lines as well that we put in that same bucket and category that you mentioned. You know, now that you're looking at this, you know, come April of, of 24, where it's, it's going to be that lower 200. Uh, subset of, of KV lines. Um, you know, our, our forestry group came to us. Um, it was, uh, goodness, I think a, about a year, year and a half ago, or maybe a year and a half ago, um, in, in the sense of you know, how we're looking at the, the approach when we rebuild a line. I mentioned earlier, you know, we've, we were fortunate to have an opportunity to invest in our system and being able to rebuild our, our existing lines. And in some cases, ensuring that we use that opportunity uh, to, to create a, you know, a clear right away, um, if it's encroachments, if it's you know, vegetation, whatever it may be, and you know, working through those um, <clears throat> constraints. And so it was, hey, we're, we're really gonna have to ensure that we focus on our, our 138s too. Um, you know, we, we 
think there's going to be a change in compliance. Um, come to find out, now there's going to be a change that, as you mentioned earlier, comes into play in the spring uh, of 24. So, what does that mean when we talk about those critical lines? Um, we meet on a recurring basis um, in ensuring that those lines meet our veg management plan to ensure that we've got proper compliance in place. Yep. So your list just got a little bit bigger. Um, and that list in the sense of what is critical, but you know, where do we have certain restrictions? You know, where maybe we've stubbed our toe along the way where a landowner may not allow us to access onto for whatever reason that may be, um, or a landowner has challenged our right to go in there and, and, and trim and or remove, um, or maybe they planted something, it finally grew up to a certain point where it's been identified based on our inspection criteria. Um, and so our support in that is you know, to continue to work with our, our forestry teams. It goes back to what I said earlier too, and the tools that we have to ensure that you know, we do it successfully and safely, you know, utilizing our GIS, you know, utilizing our databases, making sure the easement, what it reads, um, you know, and, and, and hopefully when we go out there and we talk with those landowners as to need and the why we need to get back on there. Um, you know, I could fall off of what we call the restriction log, um, but we do keep that restriction log. We do meet regularly, recurrently uh, to be able to identify the need to get on there. When is it that we need to get on there, you know, especially around that springtime when foliage is starting to grow back on the trees? Um, you know, it's very heavy for us to where we evaluate that restriction log and try to work with our forestry teams to get those accesses and to ensure the landowners understand why we need to clear what we need to clear if it's trimming and we're removing. Um, you know, in, in some some aspects, it also may give us an opportunity where you know, if the landowner is, is certainly challenging our rights for whatever reasons there may be, it, it may give us an opportunity to supplement or amend our rights to make them a little bit more clear, provide clarity where landowners are more comfortable. Um, you know, in some cases too, it could be where we're going back 100 years where that ranch or that landowner has been in the family and we stubbed our toe along the way you know, three generations ago you know, just kind of left that, that I mentioned that taste in the mouth of the customer and, you know, we're, we're still dealing with it today. And, you know, those are things that we always want to continue to keep on the forefront and, and really try to work with our customers to understand, you know, why we need to get out there. What's the work that's going to entail um, and that proactive outreach and the measures that we take, you know, we want them to fully understand why we're doing what we're doing. And you know the type of construction that's going to take place, and, and really not trying to leave any subjectiveness or, or, or level of certain uncertainty in that landowner uh, to fully understand what it is that we need to do, and how we're going to leave it and restore it back to like or better as condition would be. So um, we're working with you know kind of a long-winded answer to your question, but you know, the forestry team is is, is working through that. Um, we're working through that. We've also built some processes around that where. We can't, for whatever reason that may be, get to that full width and that right away that our standard is. You know, we've got an exemption process. It, it, it may go on that restriction log if it's definitely if it's being critical or not. So those are processes that we just, just put in place, um, you know, with the expectation that we want to document these, um, we want to be able to use the tools and the technology that we that we have to be able to properly document them. So we have to go back out there next year or two years or whatever the case may be in that cycle. Everything's right there and um, have to document and using the tools available for us to go back out there safely and successfully do the work that we need to do. Yeah, imagine if you're looking for, say, 150 foot, you can only get whatever, 135 for what for a certain reason. You've got to start clearing a lot more regularly on that right away. You, you can't let a growth season go by without doing a side trim. Yep, yep, yep. And again, that's outreach. You know, these are it's things outreach. that, that we... We haven't done, I would say, for an extended period of time, but you know, we've now been able to work with our forestry teams and our right away agents play a role in that too. But our outreach team has done a great job too of being able to create pamphlets, create door hangers. Again, it's just not going out there and physically doing the work. You know, think about yourself, put yourself in the customer's shoes in the sense of how would you like to feel if I knocked on your door? Um, you know, providing you information as to the work that we're doing, letting you know when we're going to do it, when we're going to be done, you know, pending any uncircumstances or weather related circumstances. Um, outside of just going out there, you come home and you see, you know, branches or something in the back of your yard and you yeah. kind of scratch your head. Like, well, we're, we're making phone there. calls. Yeah, we're making phone calls. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. 
Um, I want to spend the next three or four minutes talking about technology before we answer some of the questions. So technology is obviously one of the backbones of your world, I imagine. And you you touched on this when you're talking about employees and getting them up to speed. Without technology, that wouldn't happen, right? So can you talk a little bit about the types of tools that you guys have at your disposal to most effect, effectively run your group and so kind of what you have today and then also what are the requirements that you and your group have when you're thinking about adopting a certain technology to come into your ecosystem as far as how is this new technology going to leverage yeah. and play nicely with the other tools that I already have and it's not just yeah. a pilot system. Yeah, but that, well, that latter part is important. Um, you know, that's one of the things where, you know, if it's reporting or if it's integration, you know, not pancaking or we're not duplicating levels of efforts. Um, so, you know, the first piece, though, you know, what we do is so important. We touch the customer on an everyday basis. Um, you know, so really there isn't technology that's successful in the sense of getting out in front of the customer, touching the customer. Uh, yeah, we can use technology to send certain messages. Yep. But, you know, when you look at some of the things that we just talked about, you know, some of the high level examples I alluded to, where I mentioned we kind of stubbed our toe along the way, um, you know, th these are things where we're able to have information readily available. That Going back 10 years ago and, and coming into this role, when we looked at processes and procedures and best practices and, and the tools that we had, you know, GIS kind of starting to take off at that point in time, right? Um, you know, just understanding okay, this is the level of effort and work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. This is information that we receive back from the customer. So how are we collecting the data? Of course, spreadsheets, right? Everybody's using spreadsheets 10 plus years ago. Um, but in the aspect of if I'm not here in 10 plus years, you know, the information that I just put together in my spreadsheet, where's it go? Um, you know, a lot of times it's on your C anywhere. drive. Yeah, exactly. It sits on your hard drive and then yeah. it, it goes, doesn't go anywhere. Um, yeah. You know, so that was an important aspect in, in you know, talking with our internal stakeholders at AEP and then trying to identify, okay, what, what's the industry using? What are, what, what's technology that's out there? And do we do it internally? You know, do we buy a third party box off the shelf, so to speak? Um, but at the end of the day, we wanted to identify and adapt you know, the, the importance of collecting data, housing data, you know, if it's from information from landowner or agent notes from the field based on their interaction with customers and landowners. Um, you know, I mentioned some safety hazards that we have, if it's threats um, that we receive, you know, how do we house that and, and, and have it readily available for not just us, but for our field service crews, for operation crews, I mentioned our forestry crews as well. Um, so, you know, we, we adapted a platform to be able to house that information. And then the other part to that is, is, is our CapEx started increasing and our workload started increasing. Um, and then when you look at prudency in the sense of you know, maybe what we're paying for our right away, or what goes into the cost of our projects, you know, so now there's another data point or other data points that we have to kind of collect. And, how are we managing the project? You know, are we doing what we say we're going to do? Are we going to come in and acquire all the right away on time, on the schedule that was committed to? So now we have another data point. So you know, initially we're talking about just collecting information from the field, from the customer, to now kind of a project management, uh, project control standpoint. So how do you adapt all of that? Um, you know, so that was the other part that we really wanted to look at, um, and and so. <clears throat> as we look at the data integrity, which is going to be key in success to all this, um, you know, it, so what's, what's, what's next? Um, and, and that's part of where we're trying to adapt, <clears throat> where we've got integrations and tools set up, um, as I mentioned earlier, to where, you know, it's your iPhone, your Android, you're in the field. Um, you know, can you go to a location and identify, like I said earlier, through a GIS mechanism? Um, or a platform that we have, which we can. And then, you know, but if we're in the field on the project side of it, you know, now looking at, you know, can, can we utilize uh, technology to some degree, you know, have landowners sign, like, you know, you're signing for a package with EPS funds or 
Um, or can we create workflows, um, you know, to be able to do that? Can we request checks immediately, you know, right there uh, to be able to get those approved? Um, you know, all those things are starting to come into play. The other part is, you know, how are we forecasting our costs and our item projects? And that's not easy. Um, you know, the, the landscape in, in the sense of our, our project costs have definitely shifted to the high side, not to say that they were never really high, but ultimately we're seeing um, high impact quick uh, in the sense of if we look at a project today, depending on that area, we talked about those, those load centers coming in, that, that's a very high demand on property and land use. And, and so those are, are gonna quickly continue to climb and go higher. Um, so you know, one of the things that I'm really trying to work through now is when you look at schedule, you look at budget, like can we create bell curves automatically based on how our acquisition costs are going to be able to create certain levels of forecast? Um, you know, not to take anything away from the human factor of it, but at least create some levels of baselines. Um, so we're creating efficiencies. You know, the other thing that um, you're really thinking about having conversation about is you know, the AI approach or artificial intelligence approach, where you've got a lot of data kind of scattered around through what you've collected. You know, now what's it telling you? What's it, what's, what's it saying to you in the sense of your projects or where your customers are um, or, you know, what you need to be able to do that you may not have thought of uh, a little bit differently in, in the approach that we're going to take for that project, um, if it's our acquisition or if it's, you know, another strategy for our project. So, so those are all things that, you know, going back 10 years that we really evolved on. Right now, our focus is on the data integrity piece of it. The last thing that we want is to be able to have garbage in, garbage out, right? So the key to that is being able to create scripts and be able to create rules around ensuring that our agent notes are accurate, the data that we're inputting is accurate, it's telling us the story that we're expecting the story to say. Um, you know, the other part that I mentioned that we're looking at now is kind of that forecasting measure, you know, the artificial intelligence side of it. Pretty unique to me is when some of the conversations I have with my peers, not quite there on the AI side. Definitely very intriguing. I think that's a good use, a good use case for AI though. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So we have a few questions. We may not be able to get to all of them, but I think what we can do, Tom, is address these and follow up separately because I realize yeah. that people may yeah. have appointments. Let's in in uh fairness, let's let's do the first one first. Um, so this one came in, it says, how have you handled prescriptive rights of way when building or making a transmission line larger? Well, the first thing is we can't add a burden. Line. So if we've historically um, have maintained X, whatever X is, and we come in and say, we now need Y prescriptively, and we're just going to continue to ensure that we're maintaining X. And so we're never going to be able to go back and say, we're not going to go Y and just go out and clear Y, whatever Y needs to be. So from a prescriptive approach, um, you know, those are conversations that when we look at our projects, you know, it's a risk. Uh, we identify as a risk. Those are going to be high critical where we want to try to ensure that we supplement our, our rights to be able to get to Y. If we can get to Y, um, if we can't, we have to understand what we've historically done and also, you know, what was our initial intent when we built that line back when we built the line. So as we're modernizing the line today, you know, pull in, in one place, it's got to be the same pole in approximately the same place. You can't add three poles where we've got two. You can't go from 150 where we historically maintained 100, those type of things. Um, but, you know, we definitely evaluate on every rebuild project our easement rights. Uh, we've got easements there where there's gaps. Uh, in the sense that you know, we utilize what we feel is prescriptive rights. You know, we, we have sometimes done that. Oftentimes, though, I will say our teams are really good at being successful in what they do, and we're usually able to capture the different why, you know, add to if we need to add to where we need to. Perfect. Okay. Got another question for you. Question is, will your team continue to pursue competitive transmission with all the other work that's expected in your service territory? Yeah, so I, I'm going to assume one thing here that we're alluding to for quarter 1000 that came out uh, a few years back. And we created a joint venture um, called TransSource. TransSource is our competitive model. Um, 
I mentioned our central organization team that was built a couple of years ago. That team's responsible for our chart venture work that we get into. Uh, we do bid on projects uh, through Transource. Um, we have a specific team that, that does those bids, those competitive bids. Um, so, you know, we're continuing to evaluate those um, as those windows come open through PJM and through MISO most especially. We've also been on some in SPP and some other ISOs. Um, and we have been successful of being able to award bids that are, excuse me, get awarded bids, um, you know, in 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 those areas. Uh, so th those are, are are projects that we definitely look at um, and definitely are, are, are looking at that today. Okay, so I think we have time for one more. And then this last question, um, Chris, we will follow up with you um, separately just to make sure that you get your question answered. But the last question I wanna to ask today is, when you find an encroachment on the right of way, what do you do about it? Deer stand that shouldn't be there, swimming pool that's not quite right, et cetera. What do you do? Run, we run the other way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but again, we, we talked about looking at our easement rights. Every project we've got to look at our easement rights. Every project we identify encroachments. One thing that I, I really tell our team, um, and this is the, this is really hard uh, because you know, everybody kind of wants a one size fits all answer. Once well, I did it on this project, I don't understand why I can't do it on this project. And there are reasons that you probably can, and there are reasons why you probably can't. But when we look at encroachments, um, we're looking at every encroachment on its own merit and how we want to mitigate that encroachment. You know, deer deer blinds, you know, versus habitable structures. Um, you know, versus fences, they're all looked at differently. And they're all looked at differently also in the, in the aspect of where are they in the right of way that we have, um, you know, and so if it's engineering measures to take, if it's, you know, purchasing and demoing down, whatever it is, uh, if it's moving it, um, in some cases, you know, we've, we've done all that on our projects and then some, so, but, we definitely look at those and we definitely evaluate and come up with mitigation plans for all of our encroachments. Um, at the end of the day, when we have opportunity you know, to invest in our reliability for the customer, we want to be able to walk away and say the right away that we left today was better. Excellent. After this conversation, we're going to follow up with a survey um, to make sure that we hit all the things that people are looking for and we're going to ask for any areas of topics that uh, were not covered that you would like to have covered. Um, additionally, you guys can all connect with Tom and myself via email if you have follow-up questions. And of course, we're happy to connect with each and every one of you via LinkedIn. So feel free and um, connect with us that way. There was one question that was not answered. Um, if there's other questions, send them our way via email and we'll get them over to you. But we'll be sure and follow up with that last question um, as soon as we can. So Thank you, everybody who joined today, and especially thank you, Tom, for sharing this wealth of knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate the opportunity. Appreciate everybody taking the time this afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everybody.